In this video, we'll look at our first abstract task, classification. In the last video, we showed this diagram of how machine learning usually works. We have a problem, we translate part of that problem to an abstract task, and then we take an existing algorithm for that abstract task and implement it. Classification is the task of assigning a class to an example. That is one of a finite number of categories. This is the basic framework of classification. The data that we provide our system with consists of examples, which we call instances, of the things which we are trying to learn something about. In this example, our instances are emails. We must then make a series of measurements for each instance. In the case of emails, for instance, we may measure how often a specific word occurs. The things we measure are called features of the instance. We can measure numeric features, like age or speed, but they can also be categoric, like gender or color. What we measure is up to us. Picking the right features is a big part of the art of building machine learning systems. Finally, each example, each instance also comes with a target value, the thing that we are trying to learn. In classification, this is always a categorical value or a class, one of a handful of possible values. In this case, the email is either spam, an unwanted advertising email, or ham, a genuine email. Once we have our dataset collected, we can feed it to a learning algorithm. This can be anything, but it has to produce a classifier. A classifier is a small machine that makes the required class prediction. That is, it takes a new instance, one that wasn't necessarily in the original dataset and for which we don't know the target class, and it makes a guess at which the correct class is. Note that in this case, the model predicts spam for the instance over here, even though in this case, it has seen the same instance over here with the label ham. This is perfectly possible. The job of the model is not to memorize the data, but to learn from it. Often the model needs to discard specific details it has seen in order to do its job well. Let's look at some examples of how we can reduce real-world problems to classification. We'll start with handwriting recognition. Specifically, the problem we saw earlier of reading a zip code on an envelope. This involves many difficult problems. Aligning the envelope, finding the address, finding the zip code within the address, segmenting the address into digits, and so on. Our first step is to reduce the problem to a simple classification problem. We will assume we are given an image of a single digit, and the task is to predict what the digit is. This is a much simpler problem than the problem as a whole, but it's still a challenging one. We'll leave all the other problems to other people to solve. The next step is to gather some training data we can learn from. First, we need a lot of pictures of handwritten digits. This is often easy enough with a little clever automation. The second part is more challenging. Somebody needs to annotate what each picture represents. If we could automate that step, we wouldn't need a classifier. So there's no getting away from the fact that we need to do that by hand. In the 1980s, researchers at NIST, a US agency, built such a dataset. Originally for the purpose of helping the US to evaluate the many digit recognition systems that were becoming available on the market. This evolved into the MNIST dataset you see here. It contains 60,000 examples of handwritten digits. This translates very simply to classification. Each picture of a digit is an instance for our problem, and the target is one of the 10 classes from 0 to 9. Next, we need to decide what our features are. A simple way of attacking this problem is to make each pixel a feature. Here's what that looks like. For each instance, we translate each pixel to a value between 0, which is black, and 1, which is white. And this gives us instances with 784 features, each labeled with a digit from 0 to 9. We lose some information namely how these features are arranged in a grid, because the whole image is flattened to a long string of numbers. But with a bit of luck, a good classifier can still make some sense out of it. We then feed these instances to the learning algorithm, which produces a classifier. 
We then get a new example and we ask the classifier what it thinks. Once we have a classifier that does well, we can build it into a larger system for recognizing digits. Note again that we haven't fully solved the problem of character recognition because we still need to cut a sequence of digits into individual digits and feed those digits to the classifier to process the results. This is all the work we have to do to translate our real problem to the abstract problem of classification. This is often the situation. Machine learning solves part of the problem for us, but there is still a lot of engineering required to turn this solution into a working production system. Let's look at a problem that requires a little bit more work to abstract into classification, playing chess. The trick again is to make things easy for ourselves by only abstracting part of the problem. We won't solve the whole thing with machine learning, but we'll simply learn a function that will be useful in a larger chess playing system. For instance, we could take a database of chess games and label each position with which player ended up winning the game in the end. The aim of our machine learning problem is to predict for a given position which player is going to win the game. If we train such a classifier successfully, we could turn it into a chess player by simply searching for positions from which we are likely to win according to the classifier and then playing moves that are likely to lead to those positions. Perhaps you are familiar with the Minimax algorithm. You could use a classifier like this as the value function or the heuristic in Minimax. A difficult problem here is which features to use. How do we translate different aspects of a chess position into numbers or categories in a way that will allow us to predict who is going to win? One option is to report how much of each black and white piece is left, which would allow at least some positions to be predicted accurately. If one player has a strong material advantage, they will probably win. For more insightful learning, we need better features. Domain expertise can often be translated to good features. We can check whether there are passed pawns or rooks on an open file, or whether a player owns both bishops. All of these can be turned into features. The more of such features we can come up with, the better our algorithm can perform. Again, we haven't solved the whole problem of learning how to play chess, but we've abstracted part of our problem into classification, hopefully making our life a little easier. For the last example, we'll look at self-driving cars. How do we turn part of the problem of making a self-driving car into a classification problem? Here is an actual self-driving car system from 1995. They used a very low resolution black and white camera to film the road and observe the human driver's behavior to label each frame with an action. As with the digit recognition example, we simply make each pixel a feature. There are 30 by 32 pixels in the camera feed, which gives us 960 features. The actions with which we label each frame are the positions of the steering wheel. Once we've trained a classifier on this dataset and it performs well, we can hook its input up to the camera and its output up to the steering wheel. This very simple system actually drove from coast to coast autonomously in the US, albeit with a human driver executing these systems instructions. It may not be safe enough to deal with all situations, but it can certainly follow different types of road. This is what I meant by translating problems into abstract tasks. We've seen three problems, and we've translated all of them into classification problems. We can now apply a classification algorithm to see how well it does. So how do we fill in the other half of this picture? Once we have a classification task with features selected and a set of good examples, how do we actually produce a classifier? We'll look at three simple examples, a linear classifier, a decision tree classifier, and a nearest neighbors classifier. We'll only briefly explain them here to give you a sense of how these problems might be solved, so don't worry if you don't totally get it yet. All methods will be discussed in more detail in later lectures. We use this dataset to illustrate each algorithm. Its instances are penguins. The two features are their flipper length and their body mass. The class is their biological sex restricted to male or female. The question is, are these two features enough to guess a penguin's sex? Since we have only two features, we can easily plot our data set. The flipper length feature on the horizontal axis and the body mass feature on the vertical axis so that each example in our data set is one point in this plane. 
We call this space, where every feature is an axis and every instance is a point, the feature space. If we had three features, it would be a 3D space. For higher numbers of features, we may have difficulty visualizing the feature space, but that shouldn't stop the classifier. Any classification method we can come up with should, in principle, work on an arbitrary number of features. Here is a simple idea for a classifier. We draw a line. We just draw a line somewhere through our feature space, and we call everything above the line male and everything below the line female. If we draw a good line, we may get most of the examples right. This is the line returned by one algorithm for fitting such lines. As you can see, many examples end up misclassified, but some points are on the correct side of the line. Our classifier might just do a little better than one that would simply guess at random. Once we have a line that we are happy with, then if we see a new penguin, all we need to do is measure them, their flipper length and their body mass, and see whether they end up above or below the line. An important thing to note is that drawing a line is a technique that only works in two dimensions, that is, if we have two features. Our method needs to work, at least in principle, for whatever number of features we decide to use. The more generic version of the idea to draw a line is to cut the feature space in two using a line-like shape. In one dimension, the equivalent structure is a point. Anything above the point we guess is male, and everything below it we guess is female. In 3D, we can cut the feature space in two with a plane. In four or more dimensions, the shape that cuts the space in two is called a hyperplane. We can no longer draw it intuitively, but luckily the mathematics are simple. We'll see how to define this properly in the next lecture. For now, let's stay in two dimensions. Which line should we choose? The simplest way to define a line in two dimensions is with three numbers. One multiplier for each feature, A and B, and a value that is added independent of the features, C. This means that there is a three-dimensional space with axes A, B, and C, where every point in this space is a possible line in our feature space. We call this the model space. It is simply the space of all models available to us, given the assumptions we have made. In this case, the assumption is that the model is a line, and the model space becomes a three-dimensional Euclidean space. Our job now is to search through this model space for a model that fits the data well. In order to do that, we need to define what it means to fit the data well. This is done by the loss function. A loss function simply tells us how much we like a given model for the current data. The lower the value, the better. Note that the loss function has the model as its argument and the data as a constant. This is as opposed to the model itself, which has the data as its argument. The best loss function to use for classification is a complex question. We'll come back to that later. For now, we can just use the number of examples that the model classifies incorrectly. The lower this is, the better. Once we have a loss function, we can color our model space with the loss of each model. All we need to do now is find the brightest spot which corresponds to the best model. More on that in the next lecture. The problem with this particular classification task is that it just isn't possible to separate the two classes very well with a single line. This is because we are actually looking at three different species of penguins plotted together. Within each species cluster, the classes can actually be separated much easier. But if we cannot separate the data by species, we'll need to look into non-linear methods of classification. Here is one such approach, a decision tree. This classifier consists of a tree which studies one feature in isolation at every node. In this case, it moves to the left if the feature is lower than some threshold value and to the right if the feature is higher. We start by looking at the flipper length. If the flipper length is higher than 1.9, then we move to the left. And if it's lower than 1.9, then we move to the right. Next, we look at the body mass. If we end up in this node, then if the body mass is higher than 4.5, we move to the left and we return a classification of male. If it's lower than 4.5, we move to the right and return a classification of female. If the flipper length was lower than 1.9, we do the same thing, but we check whether the body mass is higher or lower than 5.3. In the feature space, that looks like this. We first check the flipper length, 
whether it's above or below 1.9. Then if we end up below 1.9, we check whether the body mass is above 5.3 or below 5.3, and otherwise we check whether it's above 4.5 or below 4.5, and we classify according to the values we see on the leaves of the tree. We won't discuss the training algorithm for these models right now. We'll save that for a later lecture. Often these decision trees are grown by adding nodes from the root until a particular criterion is reached. And that algorithm is pretty simple, but all we want to show you here is that there are other ways to carve up your feature space beyond drawing a line. Note also that the model space for decision trees is a little bit more abstract than that for linear classifiers. We can't just pick n numbers to represent a model. We have to think about the space of all possible trees labeled with inequalities on the features. In such cases, it may be better to forget about the model space and to come up with a training algorithm using a different perspective. This shape that we see here, that the classifier draws in feature space to segment the two classes, is called the decision boundary, because it's the boundary at which the classifier switches between classifying something as male to classifying something as female. If we run an actual decision tree algorithm on this data, it comes up with a much more complex tree, segmenting the feature space into many small boxes called segments. In a later lecture, we'll show you how this training algorithm actually works. Finally, here is an example of a lazy classifier. This is called k nearest neighbors. It doesn't do any learning, it just remembers the data. For a new point, indicated by the question mark, it then just looks at the k points that are closest. In this case, k equals 7. So we look at the 7 points that are closest to the point that we want to classify. And we simply assign the class that is most frequent in that set. In this case, the class is female. The value k is what we call a hyperparameter. It's a parameter of the model that you have to choose yourself before you use the algorithm. We'll discuss how to choose hyperparameters in lecture 4. Here's what the decision boundary looks like for k equals 7. The point from the previous slide is indicated in white. So that's three examples of classifiers. Linear classification, decision tree classification, and k nearest neighbor classification. A few variations are possible on this basic scheme. In these examples, we've only seen numeric features, that is features whose value is a number. It's also possible to have categoric features, features whose value is one of a small number of categories. For instance, the species feature in the Penguin dataset has three distinct possible values. Some models can only handle numeric features, in which case any categoric features have to be translated to numeric ones. We'll see how to do that in a later lecture. The problem that we've used here is what we call a binary classification problem, a task with two classes. This is probably the simplest and most well-studied type of classification. If you have more than two classes, some classifiers like decision trees and K and N can deal with that without a problem. For others, like linear classification, you'll need to find a clever way to turn a binary classifier into a multi-class classifier. Multi-label classification is a much more complex task than multi-class classification. In that case, none, one, or more of the classes can be true for any given instance. One example is predicting which genres apply to a given movie. We won't go into it in this course, but it's an active subject of research. Instead of a single verdict, it can often be helpful if a classifier assigns a score to each class. In that case, if we want a single class, we can pick the one with the highest score, but we can also check what the second most likely class is. We can also sometimes look at the magnitude of the score to see how sure the classifier is of its prediction. This is often important if the consequences of a wrong classification are very serious. To summarize, this is the basic recipe for doing machine learning. We take a problem, we translate the problem or part of the problem to an abstract task like classification, we choose our instances and our features, we choose a model class, and then we search the model space for a model that solves our problem well. The basic recipe doesn't always fit every situation, and we'll look at those cases too, but this is always a good place to start, especially when you're new to machine learning. Here's what the basic recipe looks like in code, using the sklearn library which we'll use in the worksheets. Note that the actual machine learning happens in just two lines of code. We choose our model and we fit the model to the data. All you need to do is decide your features 
and decide your target values. You can then test how well your model does. More on that in a later lecture. And keep trying different models until you get a performance that you're happy with. That's all we'll say about classification in this lecture. In the next video, we'll look at regression and at some other abstract tasks.